Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, Dr. Henok. Uh, my name is uh, Yip Sakad. Uh, I have been part of uh, Yetina Works in uh, program since August of 2022. Uh, so gladly, I welcome you all to the webinar session. Uh, just to give you some introduction, uh, today's webinar session will be moderated by Dr. Gorilla, uh, me and Dr. Zaka, and uh, the presenter is Dr. Henok Tantese. So uh, first, uh, let me tell you something about Dr. Gorilla, and then uh, she will continue introducing Dr. Henok. So Dr. Gorilla is a graduate of Addis Ababa University in 2018, and now a student of health economics uh, at Drexel University. Uh, this is uh, a very big opportunity for, for us to have uh, the presenter and also her uh, in this session. Without further ado, let me uh, leave the floor to Dr. Gaila. Over to you, Dr. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ipsa. Uh, hi, everyone. As Dr. Ipsa mentioned, my name is Dr. Gerila, and I'm currently uh, co-leading the Yetena Works Research and QA project along with Dr. Henok and um, uh, yeah, with Dr. Henok. Um, so we decided to do the research and QA project with the intention of making healthcare professionals versatile. As you might have noticed, we don't have a culture of um, in integrating research work in the medical school curriculum, even though that is very important in order to increase the analytic capacity and um, to increase the broad career options of healthcare professionals. So with this intention and with this plan, we started the research and QI project. So we will be um, doing this project by holding um, webinars just like this in the future. We'll also have a website dedicated for the research and QI project. On the website, we'll be featuring Ethiopian healthcare professionals profile. So this is uh, the first healthcare, like the, I mean, the Ethiopian researchers profile. Um, if it's possible, can I share my screen? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, So how do we plan to achieve this objective? As I mentioned, we plan to increase the versatility of healthcare professionals in terms of conducting research and uh, QI projects. So we will be holding an abstract competition with a cash prize. Uh, we'll be holding research courses and training sessions by the lecturers from world-renowned universities. We'll be holding courses like this in the future. We'll We'll do research matching by using areas of interest through Ethiopian researchers profile. So this is like this is the first Ethiopian researchers profile where people can be matched with uh, researchers from different fields within the healthcare the healthcare system, and they will they can get mentorship, uh, publication advice, and other things related to research. So we're compiling this uh, researchers profile as we speak. Uh, we also plan to hold poster presentation sessions and create an unmatched networking opportunity. And we also plan to do locally funded academic and research fellowships. So these are uh, the things that we plan to achieve uh, through the in our research and QI project. And uh, we're excited for what's to come. Um, so if we give such a review of the research and QI project. Let me introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Henok Taddesa. Dr. Henok Taddesa is a senior teaching fellow in public health, and he's also the co-director of the MPH program at Imperial College of London. Uh, he's educated in Ethiopia, UK, and Denmark, and he obtained his PhD from University of Sheffield, Sheffield in, in Scotland. He has a long line of work experience ranging from international NGOs and leading various public health projects. 
Uh, he also has a strong reputation as an instructor and he's a co-module lead for the research methods module on the MPH and MSc in epidemiology courses. Uh, so we're very excited and happy to have Dr. Henok with us to give us this webinar on basics of health research. Um, the webinar, after the webinar is conducted, we're going to have a Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, so in order to get CEU points and to assess the, uh, the knowledge of the attendees, we're going to have a Q&A at the end of the session. I'll be posting the Q&A form in the chat box. You will have 15 minutes to complete the Q&A. The Q&A will have a total of eight questions. So without further ado, sit back and let, let me give the floor to Dr. Henok. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Galila. Um, and I'm so excited to be here. Um, and as um, Dr. Galila mentioned, I've joined forces with um, Yate Nawag and um, Ethiopian Medical Association now to organize um, a research um, a theme uh, alongside a lot of uh, the really exciting work that Yate Nawag undertakes. So within this plan, we hope to um, announce some exciting research fellowships, um, but also mentorship programs and so forth. So please stay tuned uh, for additional um, information uh, on all that. But today I'm here uh, to speak about a very introductory session on research um, methodology in health. Um, as I was saying to a friend of mine earlier, this is a slightly daunting given the broad um, topic that I'll be taking on today, but equally very exciting because I know a lot of you will come to this with your own experiences and your own takes on a number of the things that I'll be raising. There is no way I'll be able to be comprehensive um, and, and tackle everything that I raise in depth because a lot of the things already, uh, all of them make up a module on their own will be covering uh, themes, really insights that I have captured through my teaching experiences to be key principles, values, approaches, methods in research methodology in health more um, generally. So there will be a lot of things that I would uh, leave out um, inevitably, but I would be very interested to um, uh, capture some of those things in the discussion uh, session at the end. So hopefully we'll be leaving enough time uh, for that. Um, so before I start, I just want to um, uh, thank Yetenog and um, the Ethiopian Medical Association for giving me this platform. Uh, Yetenog, Dr. Fussum, Dr. Galila, uh, Sunny, um, uh, and everyone I've been working with uh, so far. I really, really appreciate all the support. Uh, but also I want to acknowledge my colleagues at Imperial College who call it the research methodology uh, module with me. Um, a lot of these slides are taken from um, our teaching slides on uh, the research um, uh, methods module uh, on campus and the research specialization um, online. And so as Galila said, I'm one of the colleagues for research methods um, at Imperial College. Uh, I'm also co-director for the Master of uh, Public Health course at uh, Imperial. Um, so it's a lot of insights gathered from teaching experiences, but also my own research that I would like to share with you today. But I'd be really, really keen to hear from your side as well in terms of what you think um, with, with respect to the things that I would be raising. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to share my slides now. Can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to ask just a few questions. Uh, so if you could um, go to uh, menti.com and enter this code online, you'll be able to access um, the, the very quick poll I've put together. Um, if we can do that now, please. Everyone. 
everyone who's attending, if you are able to get online, uh, of course you are, you're attending an online forum now, uh, but if you can get on uh, menti.com and access um, uh, the poll I've put together uh, using this code, please. Yes, um, so you know you can um, you can uh, respond um, to the multiple multiple times. Um, you can choose uh, different um, answers here. Uh, so please go on. But anyway, we're getting a picture, right? We're getting that almost half of you are clinicians. Uh, medical students are uh, well represented in this uh, group. Um, you know, good number of researchers and instructors, teachers, lecturers. So that's giving me a good feel of the backgrounds, but also practitioners, um, um, public health practitioners, students, others. Um, so I know a few of my friends are coming along or coming from other disciplines. Research method has a lot of things that are um, transferable uh, to different disciplines. So that's really good to see. So I have a couple of more questions in here, but I don't see them. So I'm, I'm having a little problem here, uh, getting to the next question. Okay, yes. Okay, so this is a question around how you would describe your research experiences so far. So I expect there would be a range here as well. So uh, no problems if you haven't had a lot of research experience so far, we'll be outlining the basics. If you've had a lot of research experiences, hopefully this is still going to be interesting. Um, and there are some uh, insights um, from my side that I'll be able to share. But a lot of the things that we're going to outline are the basics of research. But um, it is the case that a lot of highly published researchers also commit a lot of uh, basic errors in terms of undertaking um, good quality research. So it's always good to go back to the basics and refresh and, um, and, and see how we are, how we are practicing research. Um, so hopefully there's good discussion that will benefit um, everyone here. Okay, so quite a range. Um, as I expected, there's more quantitative research than qualitative. It's very heartening, really good to see that there are a number of people with mixed methods uh, research experiences as well. Um, uh, so about two thirds um, are saying little to no research experience. You might be being modest here, but even if uh, you, know, you do um, feel um, that way, hopefully we can outline uh, the scope um, that the uh, the key things around around research today um, and and your contributions would be and and questions at the end would be really, really uh, welcome. Okay, so 81 people. So let's move on to the third question I put together. Um, so having said all that, what research are you interested in? Okay. Um, Qualitative research started leading, but um, was overtaken. Um, not interested in mixed methods research. Is it because you would have access to both or have you realized the challenge in there? So those are some of the things I'd be interested to highlight as we go along. Out of 74, around half say mixed methods research. Um, is it not to leave one, any one of them out? Or have you had an insight into uh, you know, where that's applicable, what the key challenges are and so forth. So we will try to unpack 
a lot of that. It's been my experience that a lot of uh, students go into mixed methods research without necessarily realizing the ins and outs for their PhDs and everything, and it becomes quite, quite challenging. It's not undoable. It is my interest area. And um, also, I'm um, sorry to um, highlight my own research experience. I've had training in qualitative research as it happens, but also in quantitative research as you would when you undertake a um, Master of Public Health um, degree, but also I've had uh, you know, an advanced training in, uh, uh, in, in quantitative methods as part of my second year training in, uh, um, it was a two-year uh, Master of Public Health course that I undertook. It's called the Europe of Health Program, which um, the first year I did in the UK and the second year um, uh, in, in, in Denmark. Um, it's uh, a lot of you would uh, recognize that by the name, uh, you know, it's one of the Erasmus Mundus uh, programs in, in Europe. Um, so I've got, uh, I feel I have um, insights into the mixed methods um, perspective, and I, I am interested in developing myself as a mixed methods um, researcher. Um, so really good to see a lot of interest there. Um, but comparing quantitative to uh, qualitative research, it, it looks like quantitative research is winning the day just by a bit. So let's delve into our, with that. So thank you very much um, to everyone who's contributed to this poll. Um, so now I will go to my slides. So that's, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm working with two screens here, so that's uh, where the delay is. So this is going to cover the basics of health research, um, you know, co co but, but covering, try to cover the whole uh, research uh, cycle, and starting from how we identify topics for research in, in public health and, and health services research, um, how we design methodologies, um, and part of that is, as a lot of you know, is, is putting together research protocols for funding, how we undertake and implement research, very important in the analysis stage, what are the things to look out for, what are the key guiding principles there, um, dissemination, what do we mean by dissemination, and then research needs to be impactful, so implementation and evaluating the impact of, of the policies that we've informed. Uh, through uh, research. Um, so another way which I quite like of, of uh, conceptualizing the research cycle is what we call the research hourglass, right? So you start, it's kind of a funnel. It's kind of a funnel. Is, there's a feedback, is there something? Uh, yep. Dr. Henoki Samala. Ah, yes. If you can make your presentation on a uh, presenter's mode line, oh, yeah, 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 no, 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 um, you know, there's so much literature to look at, regardless of the topic you pick. So you have to narrow down to a manageable research question. So that's going to be the mantra for today's talk. It's the mantra for the research methodology that we teach at Imperial College with my colleagues as well. We start from carefully crafting a very actionable, manageable, um, and, um, and narrow research question. You can't take on everything in that topic area. The, the very challenge for a lot of postgraduate students, um, the same was true with me when I was undertaking my PhD, it took me a long time to narrow down because you get distracted by different interests within the topic, but it's ever so important that you narrow down, you bite what you can chew and you don't take on too much. And um, a lot of the times supervisors are continuously engaged in pushing their students to narrow down. Then it's about choosing a relevant, pertinent research design, sampling and method. So this is also um, determined by the research question. You just don't do quantitative research because you want to. You have to make sure 
that the method that you choose is, is aligned with the research question and how you've crafted the research question. So we're going to look at some of those um, today. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, ethical and resourcing considerations. A lot of um, the issues in research are um, pragmatic choices that you have to make. It's because you couldn't collect a thousand, um, um, you know, um, uh, a data from a thousand participants that you choose to do a 250 sample size. It is because you can't necessarily undertake primary study that you, you, you go to secondary data sources and so forth. Quite often, practicality is, is part of the choices in research. So the data collection also has to be undertaken in line with the methodology that you've chosen. So usually there's a randomization, a random sampling procedure if, you've, if you're undertaking quantitative research, if qualitative research purpose if sampling. So it has to be aligned with the research methodology that you've undertaken, and it has to be executed to plan. Um, uh, some um, research traditions allow for uh, more flexibility like qualitative research, but others can be quite rigid, such as um, uh, quantitative, a lot of quantitative research. Mm, then you have to discuss your results. What do we mean by discussion? You have to put it in perspective by, in terms of you know, what others are saying. You have to put your, um, your, your you have to, you need to juxtapose the results that you've generated in view of other research in the area. And then you have to come up with meaningful conclusions and disseminations. The kind of very soft conclusion and um, uh, descriptive saying there's more research that needs to be done in this area. I've done this, there's more research is nowadays not very acceptable. You need to carve out a real one actionable for policy uh, if possible, and it should be for a lot of the research, but also in terms of um, uh, uh, indicating what, what, um, what you think um, specifically the next line of inquiry should be and how you feel your results influence the way we look at the phenomenon that you, are, um, uh, that you have explored. Um, so just to pose a question here again, um, so this is from the British Heart uh, Foundation. So they have what they call, I really like behind the headlines um, uh, compilation on their web pages. Uh, so behind the headlines, they pick up specific research outputs that's been represented in the media, right? So you might recognize some of these uh, newspapers in the UK, the Daily Mirror, the Sun, the Independent, the, the Daily Mail, the Express and everything. So they look at, the issue is a lot of um, health research is quite misrepresented in the media and in, in everyday language. Say when we, you know, um, something causes another thing, um, you know, we kind of use in literal language quite often how something is the cause for another thing. And that's quite accepted, but that's not necessarily the case. It has to be really rigorously um, uh, contested critiqued before causality can be accepted in, in health. Um, so let's just take one of the things that they uh, unpacked in, in their articles. I would really um, encourage you to go and explore um, their web uh, pages and how they go about uh, you know, demystifying some of the unrealistic claims that are made by um, uh, by uh, that are um, uh, made by um, uh, newspapers and uh, different uh, news outlets, especially in the age of social media, you know that's a major, major, major challenge. So, <clears throat> so this is a headline in the Daily Mail, quoting a very large study um, uh, on on the um, relationship between fee and uh, different health outcomes. Um, so, uh, and, and also mortality as the outcome measure of interest. But the Daily Mail's headline says, why drinking tea could help you live longer, right? Now, I just want to pose a question here. What would you like to know before you believe this headline? 
what aspects, so they say, why drinking tea could help you live longer? And this is this headline is promising that they're going to showcase a research study within the Daily Mail article, and they're going to discuss the research um, study. But in terms of their discussion of the evidence that they present for this headline, what are the things that you would look out for before you trust this, um, this statement? Um, can we have some contributions uh, in the, you can, you can post some ideas in the Q&A and I'll, I'll pick them up. In, in the chat, there's, there's a chat um, active, isn't there? Yes, there is. Right. Okay, great. Thank you, Robert. That's fantastic. So you want to know if the research was a clinical trial, because I sense that you you um you value research uh, clinical trial higher than other forms of um, evidence. So one of the things that we're going to look at today is the hierarchy of um, evidence where you know clinical trials come up around the top. So that's good. Number of study participants, type of study. Yosef, thank you again. So the bigger the number, especially in quantitative research, the more reliable it becomes, the less the sampling error. High correlation we need to look at. Um, I missed that. So I, we need to look at the causation. Is it a causation? Now that's a good, uh, Herman, thank you. Um, a, a good thing to look at, high correlation. When does it become, uh, when does it become uh, uh, causation, right? Causation is built over time, not just from one study. If you if you look at the issue of lung cancer and smoking, evidence was accumulated over so many years, over so many decades before people can reliably say smoking causes lung cancer. Uh, so, and we look at the Bradford Hill criteria to establishing causality. Uh, what made them curious? Yes, science and evidence is about politics. Um, thank you. Um, yes, RCT, uh, the sample size and methods, whether age and sex and other variables were controlled for perfect. Um, is it significantly important to know this in the first place? If T would, would give me a longer um, a lifespan, I think it, I would be very interested. Um, so, so whether it's relevant for public health, that's a good measure again, but I think in this case, we can we can say that, that it would be. Um, okay, funding and disclosure, yes. So, so the agenda in research and um, type of population under study, perfect. So whether it's, going, whether it's going to be transferable for the population that I would be interested in. Those are, Really, really um, uh, uh, great answers. Representativeness uh, of, of the sample, power, power of the study is linked to sample again. So all this randomization of the study. So all these are really comprehensive, really good answers. Uh, everything that I, uh, I had um, in mind. Um, so this is what they say. Um, so this is how they break down uh, the studies that they have looked at, um, sorry. Right, so they highlight the large sample size. They, this is uh, from a cohort study, so uh, say, uh, called um, the UK Biobank study, which call, uh, which has been collecting data from participants for um, from almost half a million people across the United Kingdom um, over so many decades. So long term follow up is a good um, strength, um, and also the big sample size. Um, and also they have controlled for a number of other factors that might have also been confounding. So we'll talk about confounding factors again. Um, however, right, every study comes out with weaknesses, limitations, right? Portion size and T strength was not, um, it was impossible to capture within the study. Whether there's a dose, response relationship, right? And also it relied on people self-reporting. Self-reporting usually leads to recall bias. People might throw information bias generally. People might overestimate or underestimate um, their usage leading to systematic bias uh, in this regard. 
um, right? So, and also, uh, you know, people might have changed their tea drinking, um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, behavior and everything. So usually you go into experimental evidence, the clinical trials that you've um, uh, mentioned, and over time, all this is collated. We undertake systematic reviews in public health nowadays, very popular. They are at the apex of the, uh, the evidence uh, pyramid. Um, uh, and and you would you know so you, you kind of go into causality over time by compiling a lot of different types of research. How was this then? They say how good was the media coverage? And they review the Guardian, the Independent, and the Daily Mail. They say the Guardian was fairly accurate. The Independent, they say, was more or less accurate. However, they say they actually linked it with specific brands when the research has not said so. They say English breakfast or Earl Grey tea is great for you. So what prompted the independent to do that? So this is where, you know, um, how evidence is represented, is fraught with all uh, conflicts of interest. But then going back to the way the Daily Mail um, represented, saying how drinking tea could help you uh, have a longer life, they are saying that it's misrepresenting the strengths of the evidence presented in that. Because as researchers, we are usually very circumspect and, and there's a good, mostly good peer review process in place within uh, journals uh, to make sure that you don't overestimate the, the, your, your, your findings. Uh, you don't uh, overclaim, um, but in terms of you know publication in public, uh, media, that's not necessarily the case. <clears throat> okay, so research question, the ever important, um, you know, uh, really paramount important aspect that we call the research question. We have a mantra on our course where we say the research question rules. So we grill our students to first clarify the research question and for them to make sure that every other step that follows draws from the research question, okay? So it determines your methodology and uh, it's, it's a means to evaluate how well you've answered your questions. You might do fantastic analysis in there. You might do so, com so much complex analysis, but at the end of the day, you need to join the circle. You need to go back to your research question and see your the hypothesis you've, you've, you've said, if, if that's applied for a number of um, quantitative research that would be front and center, you need to go back and see how well the evidence you've generated helps you either to prove um, or, or uphold the null hypothesis or, or, or answer your research question. Um, okay, so what are the qualities of a good research question? It needs to be, clear. Um, so what do we mean by uh, clear? It needs to be well-defined. Um, uh, it needs to be well-defined uh, concepts and indicators. So anything you bring, you just don't bring for the literal you know, um, uh, translation, you don't bring concepts um, into uh, your uh, research question. If you mention, say, if something is, will, will you see a few research question examples, if you say, children, their research is on, on, on children, what classification of children are you taking? Everything is scrutinized um, and it needs to be clear and as specific as possible, measurable, right? In the concepts that you draw into your research question need to be, you need to be able to operationalize them into instruments that you would then go on and collect data on. It needs to be focused, not too broad, and we'll see some examples now um, and feasible, whether it's if it's your master's dissertation, are you going to do it within, is it feasible to answer that question within three or four months? If it's your PhD, are you going to undertake that within um, you know, three years and so forth, um, depending on the scope of the study being proposed. Uh, so additional things to look out for are the research gap. The research gap, um, right, whether you've identified a specific research gaps, and this comes from undertaking a thorough literature review, and whether the question you're asking incites 
interest? Is it timely? And is it relevant for the fields of public health and epidemiology? Public health being quite whole encompassing. I consider a lot of clinical research to, to fall within um, public health, unless it's strictly wet lab science type of uh, research. Um, so feasible research questions, and these are taken from studies undertaken um, mostly at Imperial um, and, um, and, and published studies. So for instance, the first one, are there differences among social uh, demographic groups in their use of active travel in the four countries of the United Kingdom observed in data um, uh, from Understanding Society, a national representative survey of UK residents between this period. So see the number of things this very specific. This is from a colleague of mine, Dr. Anthony Laverty and his team have done this um, study. Um, um, so uh, you, 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 can, you can see here a number of uh, clear concepts are represented and in their discussion, in their methods chapter, they will outline what, what they mean by social demographic groups, what they mean by active travel, how that's going to be measured. And they have specified the geographic scope so if they've left out the geographic scope, it becomes very difficult to undertake or, or see what this um, research is going to be about. They have even give you an indication of, of the data, uh, where that's going to come from. So we undertake this um, um, uh, activity uh, within our research methods um, module where we ask students um, to, uh, we give them a very broad question and we ask them to narrow down. And we go step by step by seeing how they kind of refine the research question. If you look at the third example there, what are the adult patient reported barriers and facilitators to antiretroviral adherence in Sub-Saharan Africa from 2005 to 2016 in studies with, with qualitative and quantitative methodology? I can already tell that this is going to be a review and the time that it covers, and it's interested in barriers and facilitators. It's about antiretroviral adherence in Sub-Saharan Africa. So you could, you know, you could already see that things are quite, um, you know, uh, specific. Uh, so that's what you know you would look for uh, in terms of uh, specifying your uh, research question, and it's a stage-wise process. Now, what's the aim then? You, usually, you don't have a research question in published research. Um, but what you have is a statement of aim that usually comes at the end of the literature review or the introduction section. The aim is literally your research question. Um, so if you look at it's uh, your research question, but crafted in a statement form rather than a question. So if you look at this research question, how does the examination period influence unhealthy eating behavior amongst double university first year students? I thought I'd plug in uh, Dubuque University, where I did my first degree in in public health um, as um, as a health officer in Ethiopia. Um, so, um, um, but but essentially, if you look at the research question and then when you um, translate that into an aim, this is to determine how the examination period influences eating behavior amongst uh, sorry for the typo there amongst Dubuque University first year students. Right, literally word for word translated from the research question. Um, but it's it's as important as the research question. Uh, it's literally the same thing. Um, but what it does is it gives you the scope. Then you can have specific objectives underneath, but the aim determines the scope of the research. So this is about, we'll come to some of the major soap regarding research. This is about making your work more reliable. What do we mean by reliability? If someone else comes in and tries to replicate your work, they can see exactly what you've done and are able to, um, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, repli replicate the results. But also, it has to do with validity that you're 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 being guided by clear objectives, and these are all clearly broken down. So for this aim, the first objective could be about designing an instrument. You could take a valid instrument that exists out there and adopt it, or you could um, you know, develop a questionnaire from, the, from scratch, specify which exam periods, and measure, you know, go out, collect data, and measure um, behavior, both 
uh, and uh, in and out of the exam period, and you will do your analysis to generate your results at the end. So the objectives are a stepwise uh, um, uh, uh, implementation. A stepwise, um, uh, these are steps leading to your aim. One pitfall within, in terms of stating um, objectives, usually problems when people put together protocols is the objective becomes essentially a repetition of the aim. And sometimes it can be somewhat, you know, unmeaningful steps, right? Small tasks could be written as objectives, or even in some occasions, the objectives can be stated with scope that's even beyond the aim that's been stated, and that can be very confusing. So those are um, some of the things to look out for. So another example, um, so you can say here to use retrospective data from volunteers in the UK to assess if apps, so you could specify the apps there. I, I remember we took this from a particular study, can be used to measure physical activity levels. The first thing is to find average values for time spent on foot using, cycling and total physical activity using this app. Construct daily and weekly summary profiles. This looks to be a quite a descriptive study. And then you can correlate these measures with subjective questionnaires. You can draw subjective questionnaires and see how the findings from the two could correlate to each other, thereby being more analytical um, if they have uh, done more statistical analysis there. So from the, from the research question, then, um, you know, uh, and, and as part of the refining process of the literature question, you need to undertake a good, good, solid literature review. So one is to identify research done by others, but it's not just that. A common pitfall for students and many researchers can be that the literature review ends up being quite descriptive. It becomes being a listing exercise. So-and-so has done this. So-and-so has done this. No. The literature review is also a process of summarization. You need to summarize um, the research that's been undertaken before you. You can do that by theme, by variables, or by chronologically. So it needs to be quite cohesive, summarized, um, not turn by turn. Because if you do like one by one uh, describing each study, then it becomes so difficult for people to follow and to see at the end what your added contribution can be. So you need to present the works of others in a logical sequence. You need to thoroughly reference the work so that you acknowledge previous work and voices. Otherwise, people can't tell what your assertions are from what comes through from the literature. Evidence of in-depth critical evaluation. Now, this is the challenge, right? So you need to look at some of the measures of rigor in research validity, reliability, and generalizability, which is consistent with the tradition of research that um, uh, the study claims to have undertaken, whether it's quantitative, quantitative, or mixed methods, and evaluate what they have done, mm, and critic. So you could say this brings very positive results, but the sample size is small. Or you can say they've left out certain variables that should have been controlled for, or maybe they haven't been, the study hasn't been informed by theoretical perspective, so it's bound to be less comprehensive and so forth. Highlight emerging issues or questions. So what are, and this is, <clears throat> this is building up to your rationale. At the end of your literature review, you need to have two or three substantive claims for why you should undertake this research. So you need to um, highlight emerging gaps and then you need to cite uh, sources appropriately. Um, so again, focusing on your research objectives, you need to follow structure. It shouldn't be overly descriptive. It should, you should include some critical evaluation. When we mean critical evaluation, it's not critiquing every study turn by turn, but it's about summarizing and showing where there are gaps, weaknesses in the studies undertaken. You could say there's all these studies, and then you might say a lot of these are cross-sectional studies, so they are uh, quite weak in terms of making any claims towards causal links. So the next study seems the next frontier is a clinical trial, and that's what we're going to venture uh, to. And then thoroughly referencing. Okay, 
beware of student drift, but I think I would call that researcher drift, um, where you come across really interesting um, things as oftentimes happens, and then you, you bring a lot of those things into the conversation and, and, uh, and, and, you, and, and you lose focus. So you need to keep disciplined and critiquing and ana it's an analytical procedure. It's not um, you know, an essay that you're writing. That's what we tell our students um, a lot of the times. It's, it has critical measures within which you're going to be evaluated upon, whether you submit that to journals or you're submitting that for assessment. <clears throat> okay. So um, in terms of literature review, what might be new to some of you um, um, is, is what we call systematic reviews, um, or, or because a lot of you are going to be from, as we saw from, um, you know, medical sciences and, um, and health, uh, it might, that might not be the case, but systematic reviews are at the apex of the evidence pyramid nowadays, especially if that involves a meta-analysis, what we basically mean is that you're collating the evidence across so many studies and summarizing and pulling the results together and, and kind of uh, trying to arrive at, um, uh, you know, um, at, at a pulled uh, outcome uh, measure, um, measure of risk or relation, uh, associations and things like that. Um, so that makes it a very strong source of evidence. So it's not a mere literature review, but a highly analytical, highly regimented. You start by making sure that you done a very comprehensive search for potential studies to be included. So you're not cherry picking evidence or, or leaving out um, important things. So you have to look for the different databases where research could be found. You have to include all potential studies that should be included and you should demonstrate that. Um, you know, if you have never come across systematic reviews, just do a simple Google search and look for some examples of systematic reviews and how they go about. There are different Guidelines, Cochrane uh, is the major um, agency in the world that um, provides guidance around how to undertake systematic reviews. You can look up the Cochrane collaboration as well. Um, but this is this is a new, uh, you know, a, a relatively a new um, thing that's uh, entered um, the health field. Not new anymore, uh, but it's come through what we call the evidence-based movement in in medicine. So it's, it's trying to, to minimize random error that comes from poorly designed studies or, um, uh, or, or studies that might have um, it produced um, you know, random errors for any given reason. Um, so systematic reviews in, the, in terms of the um, evidence um, uh, pyramid are at the apex. Um, <clears throat> then you know, as you uh, go down from there, you've got the randomized control trials, the experimental studies, then you've got the observational studies, um, like uh, you know, cross-sectional uh, studies, ecological studies, and so forth, um, uh, and cohort studies, um, uh, case control studies, case reports, individual cases, uh, which is very common in clinical uh, medicine, and expert opinions at the end. Now, sometimes this hierarchy is um, is critiqued when it becomes the all and be all of how we look at evidence because all evidence has to be looked at in context and with many things um, in mind, but it is a guide that we have in, uh, in evidence-based uh, public health. So the Bradford Hill criteria. So as I said, uh, causality, causation is kind of the holy grail of, of uh, health research, right? You, you want to know if something leads to another outcome. But oftentimes it's so difficult to generate that level of um, uh, uh, reliable link between two variables. Um, because say for instance, the example between T and um, mortality, um, in the real world, there are distal and proximal determinants, so many factors that influence a person's health. Starting from the global level nowadays, we say we live in a global uh, village at the national level, within the community, um, within the person and their characteristics and genetic determination as well. So there's so many things you need to rule out 
or control for before you can say that there is a causal link between something and another. Um, so a lot of confounding factors. One of um, the key examples that I brought here is, for instance, at first observation, you might see that um, Down syndrome seems to is is linked with um, the uh, um, the 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 the, num the the pregnancy. Um, um, uh, you know, if a pregnancy is a, a woman's fourth pregnancy or fifth pregnancy, so you might say, you know, if a, you know the the younger the child, the more likely uh, that might be the case. Um, because you know, at first look, that is what you see from the data. Um, but really, we now know what's really um, associated with this is is the link between Down syndrome and the mother's age. Right, so you need to control. Usually, you need to control for age, sex, ethnicity, other behavioral patterns. For instance, um, you know, in terms of sedentary behavior and and heart disease, should you also uh, control for age? Um, uh, you know, other behaviors like smoking um, and alcohol consumption and things like that. Um, so. So the Bradford Hill uh, criteria lists about nine criteria that should be fulfilled in terms of you know, determining uh, causal links. You know, one, one thing is temporality. If something precedes the cause that it has given rise to, then you know, uh, that's a good um, sign. Uh, plausibility in terms of biological mechanisms, is there a plausibility that um, or other knowledge the strength of the association does a change in one give to a big rise in change in magnitude or other factors in the other and so forth. So causality is looked at in all these things. And one of the things, um, you know, the focus for today um, would be for us, the study design, how robust a study has been, how um, is their face validity? We call it face validity. Are we, um, are we confident yeah, uh, in, in, in how the researchers have gone about designing their study and, and generating um, data and, and uh, presenting their results? Have they overclaimed or not? Um, okay. <clears throat> so quantitative research methods um, is, is a formal uh, uh, process um, uh, of, um, of, of, of uh, um, using numerical data um, uh, to, uh, to obtain information about the world. But it has philosophical underpinnings as well. So what we call the positivist approach, objectivism, objectivity is quite rationality. So these are all historical discussions. And a lot of our approaches in quantitative research come from the natural sciences like um, physics, chemistry, uh, where um, you know where natural experiments are done without any interference from the uh, researcher. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind when we go to. We'll discuss that a little bit later when we go to the uh, qualitative research. It's a different perspective. Actually, in the 18th century and so forth, you know, uh, qualitative thinkers, philosophers, kind of opposed the universal application of this perspective in knowledge generation. And they started saying that we can't just apply, um, um, you know, positivist um, thinking and a lot of the philosophical perspectives that underlie quantitative research to understand the social world. But quantitative research helps us to measure things, prevalence, associations, cause and effect relationships, effectiveness, the things that are generated from a lot of clinical research, clinical trials. Um, so, where, you know, new health technology, health technology assessment, you know, vaccine trials, drug trials, all implement strict formulated criteria. Um, again, qualitative research within its own worldview and philosophies, uh, in, you know, um, implies strict criteria, but so what we mean here is quite rigid criteria that kind of um, you know, upholds objectivity and other things that are determined within the philosophy above all else. Um, so that's why we randomize uh, people into different uh, groups. Um, that's why we 
blind researchers to the different allocation groups within clinical trials. So that, you know, it's an unadulterated uh, production of findings that, um, you know, uh, uh, emphasize that. Whereas when we come to qualitative research, and, uh, you know, the, the uh, involvement of the researcher is not curtailed as much as quantitative research. Uh, so it can be a qu quite concise and reductionist, and a lot of people might say, uh, but uh, it has different um, uh, study designs still. Okay, so some examples of uh, research designs, what are the determinants and prevalence of e-cigarette use throughout the European Union? What is, so, uh, so looking at determinants and measuring this, uh, what is the effect of long-term exposure to air, air pollution on COVID-19 mortality in England? These are all taken from studies um, uh, that have been published. Uh, so when you look there, these are the measures here are effect, cause and effect relationships, or you know, looking at determinants, what um, influence one variable might have on another, um, you know, differences, measuring differences or relationships, and so forth. Um, so qualitative research, as we say, is quite fitted for the what type of questions, um, uh, whereas, and, uh, whereas qualitative research can be more suited for how and why type uh, questions. Okay, so the different study designs, as we say, they have their advantages and disadvantages. Some are, the, you know, so we don't just strictly follow um, the, uh, the evidence um, uh, pyramid, um, hierarchy pyramid for, for uh, reasons of practicality and cost, for instance. Randomized control trials can be prohibitively expensive uh, to set up in different contexts, but also there might be, it might not be ethical to set up uh, randomized control trials for, uh, for some, um, uh, uh, for some uh, research topics. Um, case controlled and, and cohort studies being longitudinal, um, <laughs> data available um, in, in this uh, uh, can, can be the next um, choice in populations, cross-sectional within a cross-section in time can be analytical as well because they can give us insights into the relationship between exposures and, and outcomes, so those could be good. Um, and ecological, when we, uh, uh, you know, when we compare groups populations vis-a-vis uh, -vis one another. So this here's a complete list of you know, advantages and disadvantages of the different study designs. So we need to look at all this before we decide, but also think about, as we say, think about, um, think about our, um, our research question um, at all times. So the choice should be guided by, if it answers the research question, is it ethical? I've got a slide on ethics and, and, and research governance. So hopefully we'll raise some of these issues there. Um, practical reasons, do you have budgets for it? Do you have the team to undertake the proposed um, research? Will the results, results be valid? Um, uh, you know, um, so have you done everything that's prescribed by the research community within that uh, field, um, within that um, method? Um, it's, it's important and also, um, you know, at the end, you need to disseminate um, and, 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 um, and make all your steps available so that uh, it's reliable, so that others could replicate um, the steps that you've undertaken. That's why you have expansive methods description uh, in your methods section. Um, so rigor <clears throat> is so important in qualitative uh, in quantitative, qualitative, mixed methods, any type of research that you do. Um, so, uh, so in terms of validity, is it's about how well you're measuring the thing that you set out to measure. How fit for purpose um, your um, your your methods um, and your procedures are. Okay. Um, so, are you using valid instruments that have been proven? Have you done? pilots to make sure that it is fit to measure the different theoretical constructs, conceptual constructs implied by your research question? Have you done your analytical procedures, your statistical, in terms of quantitative research, your statistical analysis is, is has, you know, has matched participants, has done, uh, you know, stratification where needed, has, has done all, you know, analytical um, 
uh, uh, procedures that are upheld by the community of practice uh, to, to uh, produce that. Um, and reliability is about how well um, you, know, uh, you have described the methods within your research and made them available and have consistently applied them so that others could come and uh, reproduce your research. Now, another thing is generalizability in terms of quantitative research. Someone said earlier um, in, in, in the chat about representativeness. Quantitative research is always about saying more. It's about extrapolating to the wider population. Right, so, so there the sample size becomes important that you've taken random sample and you know, you've mitigated any problems that might come uh, out of, um, uh, you know, um, out of the, the research um, uh, approach that you've um, undertaken any limitations to do with your, um, your, your study design or the way you've conducted it, you've done enough to mitigate some of those is, is very important as well. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so in terms of um, the errors that we described earlier, random errors are bound to happen always. It's always about minimizing them because the way you sample from a population, so if you're interested in the Ethiopian population or Addis Ababa or Dilla, for instance, you can't um, collect data from each and every. So censuses do that, but usually there's no budget, it's unpractical. You know, and it's not necessarily um, a good practice to collect um, data from everyone at every point. So you take a sample and you approximate about the wider population in, in surveys and quantitative research. Um, so, <clears throat> so usually the results, if you do say 200 studies, the results would congregate around the mean. Right, this is what we call the phenomena of clustering around the mean. Um, so uh, through the p-values and the confidence intervals that you see in papers, what people are trying to say is to show the confidence in the study, uh, given the sample size and different characteristics in the study, um, how confident we are that this study uh, you know, approximates the, the true value in the population, the true mean value, for instance, if you're looking at average, um, you know, um, uh, within the wider population. Um, so, um, so usually um, uh, the p-value of 0 0.05 or 95% or cutoff, um, these are, um, you know, the skews at the end is, is taken as, 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 you know, it's, it's a conventional thing to say, you know, this is if something, if you generate a result that's below 0 0.05, you generate good confidence that you can reject the null hypothesis. That means that, um, you know, uh, the, uh, if you take 100 studies, 95 of them are likely to produce a similar result like yourself, right? Uh, so that could be one way of explaining this. Or the null hypothesis could only be true in 5% of a given number of studies that would be undertaken in that population. So you have very good confidence. So it doesn't rule it out completely, but it rejects it for now, given the fairly good amount of confidence that's been agreed by, by uh, the research. And, and then confidence interval, it gives you a lower bound and the higher, mm, the upper bound um, to show you um, where 95% um, of the studies um, would, 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 would generate a range. And if your range is within, you know, if you have a narrow confidence interval and if your uh, range, um, you know, excludes certain numbers uh, for um, uh, 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 relative risks, if it's, you know, if it avoids one or for risk um, differences, if it avoids zero, then you can be 95% confident that you have got, um, you know, a valid uh, result, statistically speaking. Um, but with, with their own uh, caveats. Um, so one, one perspective from this is if you don't control for, uh, so sometimes there could be fishing for, uh, you know, a significant, so we say statistically significant values, and that could be, that could determine researcher practice, rather, um, you know, there are, you know, cases where people do their analysis in different ways, they leave out certain variables and things like that, and do their regression analysis to produce 
and you know p-values that are significant. So that's not a good practice. Um, your um, the variables you include in your model, the synthesis you do should be guided by your research question, should be informed by the literature, and you should be able to share negative results as well. What we mean by negative results might be, you know, ne not necessarily statistically significant results. Um, because they can be clinically important outcomes, even though um, they might not have uh, generated those, but also people learn from negative outcomes. So there's what we call publication bias, people not um, um, uh, being encouraged to publish uh, results if they don't generate the thing that they are, the outcome that they are uh, looking um, for. So that's, that's something to avoid. So, Beyond random error, and there are different types of systematic errors that can be um, um, introduced into a study. We've got observer bias to researchers could do things quite differently and you could end up incorporating your own biases and your own, you know, by not um, uh, following um, the, the procedure strictly, but also there's information um, bias in studies where People could recall things <clears throat> differently. Um, uh, so, so you need to um, you need to make sure um, that you know one undertake all that you can that so that you can um, but also selection bias. <clears throat> sorry. Um, so you might select individuals um, who would who are likely to be healthy, for instance or because they are healthy, they are likely to respond, or the group that hasn't responded, or the group when you're following people for 10 years or over, the people who drop out, this is a common problem with cohort studies, the people who drop out might be systematically different from the group that has remained in your study. And so it becomes very difficult for you to, um, to uh, generalize to the wider population. So th these are all things that um, you need to keep in mind, do everything you can to mitigate, document the procedures, but also at the end, uh, you know, do anything and um, other things in your statistical analysis to control for this, but also um, discuss this transparently in your limitations. The thing about stating, if you've looked at, um, you know, this, in the discussion sections, Mm, you know, researchers discuss their limitations. So that shows that they are transparent. It's good practice, but also that shows that they are aware of this. They're not oblivious to this um, practice. So if you are submitting work for assessment, your marker will be very happy for you, um, uh, with you if you've um, done that. But also they are likely to pen uh, penalize you less if you um, if you have shown that you're capable of knowing the the um, um, you know the implication of your work. No research is, is is without fault. So if you can describe that and put your work and your findings in perspective of potential limitations, that's always a big plus. So confounding we've discussed, um, you know, um, so uh, you know things that might be related with the the exposure. Uh, and the outcome variable, but they are not in the same pathway. And so they are not mediating the relationship, but they uh, influence uh, both. So you need to control for those by, you know, randomization, matching participants, say, by the same age group uh, or, or sex or other variables you are interested in, or just doing your um, analysis within the same group. Or you could do things like progression and uh, stratification and apply other causal inference methods um, within your uh, statistical analysis. Okay, so um, in terms of um, outlining the things that um, you know we've seen, so the final outcome is you would send out uh, usually yeah, your, um, your paper for publication in your chosen uh, journal. Um, so some of the common uh, <clears throat> reasons for rejection could be because you haven't picked up an important scientific issue to a relevant scientific issue to look at. Um, um, the study does not actually test the author's hypothesis. Again, the research question, 
a different study design should have been considered. You should have considered a qualitative research design, but you've done a quantitative one because you want to do that uh, without due, um, uh, you know, emphasis on on on, on alignment between um, your research question and the method you've chosen. Uh, chosen um, practical difficulties in recruiting participants, so suboptimal sample size at the end, or you know, sampling wasn't quite right. The sample size was too small. The study was um, uncontrolled when it needed to be, statistical analysis being done incorrectly, um, and the authors uh, are drawing unjustified conclusions. So you might be talking in terms of even the literal representation of your words. You know, this gives rise to this. This is acceptable in literal language, but you need to be very careful when you mean to say something about association and correlation and you might give um, the wrong impression that you're making a claim about causal uh, links. Um, but also just to add from a different um, reference here, where they also um, highlight problems with, um, you know, uh, the way you package your manuscript is so important as well, right? So the final write-up can make a whole lot of a difference. Uh, so keeping um, you know, an eye out for that. Um, <clears throat> but also reviewers are also active uh, players in this space. So uh, usually there's, um, there's a pun uh, that goes around within the research community about reviewers too. Uh, so reviewer too is this hypothetical, overly critical reviewer who always would reject um, papers, whereas you know, reviewer one would be the more um, reasonable. Um, uh, we're uh, arbiter of, of research. Um, so all these things matter in terms of succeeding within the research field and getting the, your, your research outputs um, out there. Um, so in the process, you would generate a lot of uh, data, but also you would oftentimes, if you're undertaking quant quantitative research, you'd be working with a lot of um, you know secondary data sources. There's so, um, there are, very, very critically important steps um, that you should, um, and then practice that you should adhere to. Um, you need to understand your data, the structure of your data, what your data is going to allow you to answer and not the documentation uh, of your data is so important. The way you store the data, your ethical responsibilities around the data to make sure that you know, data could not be linked and um, and even you know in anonymous data, it's been shown that sometimes um, uh, you know data can be linked to individuals. If you've done you know household uh, data and things to make sure that the way you share um, data uh, you know adheres to all protocols in terms of uh, doing all these things. Okay, so just to give you an example, the closer partnership is is a partnership within the UK. There are so many cohort studies, uh, so many cohort studies um, that focus on different population groups, some which have been going on since you know, the 1960s and the 1970s, following the same uh, people over time, hundreds of thousands of people, in some cases, thousands of people in most cases. Um, so there's an initiative trying to avoid data duplication, enable data linkages so that, you know, we can enable different types of, um, uh, you know, um, studies. So a lot of these are openly available. Uh, you just need the right level of um, approvals. A lot of our students, for instance, apply and access this data uh, to write up their dissertations and, and publish from these um, uh, data sets. Um, so good. Um, data management uh, practice enables you to access uh, all this effectively. So now let's transition, as I'm looking at the time here, let's transition more to how we compare qualitative research to quantitative methods. This is, of course, uh, in the spirit of uh, uh, light-hearted um, uh, depiction. Um, so if we consider quantitative methods about counting, Qualitative methods could be about eliciting more in-depth resource uh, with, um, uh, findings, but also, you know, this is too simplified and it's in jest that I shared this, but, but it's more about interaction between 
Um, so as you can see, the quantitative research is, the researcher is away from the field of research and essentially observing what, what happens in an uninteractive manner, whereas the qualitative methods allows you and encourages you to interact with your participants and, 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 and generate more richer uh, findings. <clears throat> so, um, so in terms of some key comparisons, you know, probability-based um, uh, random sampling is not as important or, or not important in qualitative research. More of it's about purposive sampling, making sure that different types of participants are in, that that would inform the, the your uh, the phenomenon that you're interested in from um, a theoretical conceptual perspective are included. In terms of generalizability, it is generalizable, but not in the same sense as quantitative research. So you're not trying to generalize to the wider population, but you're trying to generalize about steps, about um, processes. Uh, so they call it modicum generalizability or transferability in qualitative research. So it's trying to do more of showing people how certain mechanisms work or how certain uh, phenomenon experiences, perceptions work, and putting that more in, in terms of, you know, conceptual perspectives and generating rich um, uh, awareness um, in terms of uh, social life, human life, and so forth. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, they are more suited for how and why questions for this reason. And if you're combining the two, usually qualitative research comes in, the, in at the beginning, when you don't know the variables that might be implied to, to incorporate into your quantitative design, you might be interested in exploring through um, a, a qualitative um, uh, study and then using um, the findings to operationalize into variables and measure through quantitative research, but that's not the only way. Um, it generates rich data, usually very time consuming textual data, uh, and design can emerge as the study unfolds. There's a lot of um, flexibility in qualitative research. Of course, principles um, are always um, upheld, um, but you could always, you know, kind of adjust um, the focus of your study as you go along with something which is not necessarily, um, uh, which is not necessarily uh, in play in, in, in quantitative uh, methodologies. Um, so the researcher, has a very enhanced role in qualitative research where it is said the researcher is the instrument. So um, the researcher has, so the way I generate and the generalizability comes from this. So the, if I write a qualitative piece of work, what I say is in a reflexive manner, this is how I did my study. This is me, I write myself into my study and I say, this is how I think about this issue. These are my personal characteristics. And this is the study that I have generated. So it's up to you to, to transfer some of the findings into your own case, given that I've given you a rich account of uh, myself and how I've gone about um, gener generating um, the findings. Okay. So a really mm, interesting, um, so some three examples of qualitative studies, for instance, um, these come from a letter written uh, to the British Medical Journal on account of by about 75 academics in the UK, led by uh, Trisha, uh, Professor Tricia uh, Greenhall, who's um, a renowned public health um, expert uh, scientist in the UK where they highlighted that the BMJ tends to reject qualitative studies and they question why that's the case upon submission. Um, you know, so as I said earlier, there's always been this power, you know, relationships. There's always been a bit of a skew towards quantitative research um, because that's seen as, you know, the more established uh, tradition in medical um, research, clinical research. Um, and, and so they, it's a really interesting uh, paper that they sent to the uh, uh, editors of the BMJ where they go in and unpack. Uh, so they, um, they, they actually caught uh, the studies that were listed as one as some of the most influential in the 20 years of the British Medical Journal, um, uh, in, in over 20 years um, at the British Medical Journal. And three of these were qualitative. 
uh, only three others were actually what could be called quantitative studies. The rest were actually opinion pieces and different other commentaries. And they say in their letter that the, quant the qualitative research were more cited than the quantitative studies. Hence, you could think that they have been more impactful in the field. Uh, and they highlight um, the ones that were highlighted as um, you know, best studies. So the first one, just to see, is evidence-based guidelines or collectively constructed mind, uh, mind lines. Ethnographic study of knowledge management in primary care. So what basically happened over two years or so is researchers went into primary health care settings and tried to see how clinicians, when a, say a difficult case comes, what, uh, how uh, uh, um, clinicians resolve. And what they can, came up with is this idea of constructed mind lines that rather than go to protocols, go to references at every instance, clinicians, uh, relied upon each other. And there were, you know, cult you know, culturally, contextually defined ways of working through difficult cases that come to a GP or, prim uh, or a primary healthcare um, practitioner. This is very difficult to depict through a quantitative survey or another methodology. So the you know um, so qualitative research can give you a very contextualized, very very um, in depth look at things, and maybe this research is more relevant to day to day uh, practitioners, and hence it it being more cited um, and shared. Um, so they um, so they do this. So this just to help um, kind of consolidate um, you know the differences that we are um, outlining uh, between the two here. Um, <clears throat> But so between qualitative and quantitative studies, mm, you know, there's a lot of philosophical, conceptual issues that underpin the way researchers undertake their research. So this is from a, mm, an exercise in class that we undertook. You know, so positivism is on the end of the quantitative research, relativism and idealism literally saying that experiences are different human life cannot be reduced, social life cannot be reduced into numbers. You need to understand things in, you know, in, a, in the rich context. Um, and, and my conclusion and the way I undertake my study could be completely different to yours and it's still valid. So between those two, there are also middle range philosophical perspectives that intermarry the two and say, yes, we need to allow for more flexibility, but also you know, um, the, the, um, the, we need to also, um, you know, capture um, some of those um, experiences in, in the quantitative way as well. And, and those give rise to more of, you know, the mixed method uh, uh, practice that we see um, being popular nowadays. So the bridge building, pragmatism, empathic realism, uh, you know, underlay um, those, um, those practices as philosophical grounds. Okay, but validity, reliability, generalizability <clears throat> still applies in qualitative research. Uh, so we want researchers to come and replicate our findings. We want to use valid instrument, valid ways of undertaking the study. So we're not we're not trying to um, take a big sample size because our interest is not a wider population necessarily. As we said, it's not about approximating how the uh, our measures occur in the wider or, or a true population measure, but we are, we still need to kind of undertake steps. So you might interview 15 people and that would be absolutely valid, but we need to also include unique voices in, in our interviews. Um, and the way we write up, the way we ask the questions shouldn't be leading questions. So we are not influencing the research outcome at a whim and everything else. So there's, there's, there's a, a whole, uh, you know, tradition, methodological uh, guidance around how we undertake qualitative research. So instead of the numbers, uh, you know, the measures, uh, uh, the mean, median, and everything, and you know, risk estimates and everything that we generate from a random uh, from um, a quantitative research, what we come up with is is a lot of text, and still it's about summarizing. It's about summarizing the data 
and displaying it with the, reducing the data and displaying it within a 3000, 3500 word paper or in any kind of other format. But you might have begun with you know, hundreds of pages of um, transcripts. So, so you, you generate codes, you organize those codes into different categories, you look for different explanatory theories and try to take a really rich, deep account of the mechanisms of, uh, of, of behavior or whatever phenomena that you, that you have explored. So different types of um, qualitative research procedures, some could be observations like ethnography, uh, you know, or, uh, others could be discourse analysis, you know, analyzing the way people frame different things, the way we refer to a disease or a condition could have power implications in it, or it could be discriminatory for certain groups of people. It can have implications. So unpacking the discursive practices and how those influence, um, but it could be content analysis, looking at you know, essentially thematic analysis, the themes that come through, organizing those into different um, categories, grounded theory, where the aim is about generating theories. So, so um, there's what we call the constant comparator uh, method. Um, people try to go to the research field without a lot of, um, a, a lot of, um, without looking at the literature a lot or, or existing theories because they want it grounded in the data. They want the data to offer fresh perspectives. It has its own tradition and methods involved. Um, framework analysis is a more formalized um, type of uh, thematic analysis. So as I said at the outset, we're not able to go into um, any of this in great detail, but um, just to provide an overview of what's possible in terms of the analysis. Um, um, so mixed methods. So we, we nowadays mix methods so that we are able to answer the research question quite comprehensively. So the mixing usually happens after we've done the analysis for the qualitative and the quantitative separately, but, um, but the mixing just doesn't happen at there. It needs carefully designed. So it needs to be carefully um, designed from the outset in terms of how we uh, organize um, our questions and the different steps, but, um, but essentially it's trying to um, answer um, the question from a 360 perspective drawing on the qualitative as well as the quantitative procedures. Um, so some examples of how that can help. So for instance, the first study was a quantitative study that said a surgical safety checklist to reduce morbidity and mortality in a global uh, population. Um, so this actually found that the checklist works quite well to reduce morbidity and mortality in some centers, but not others. So the qualitative research went in depth and tried to understand from different ethnographic studies. So this is, um, this is a systematic review of the qualitative evidence, looking at barriers and facilitators related to the implementation of surgical safety checklists. So the qualitative research looked at the context, the teams, the differences, the power dynamics between surgical teams, and how it's not just the surgical checklist that makes a difference, but the actual dynamics into which this uh, checklist is injected has, has a role. Um, coming to the end, I know uh, we're, we're uh, slightly running over time because uh, I want to, um, we want to allow enough time for um, the interactions. Um, but just to say, ethics is ever so important in research, whichever type of methodology you undertake. And it's not, just about how well you respect people. It's, it's centrally that respect, dignity, and concern for participants and all stakeholders and having mm, you know, a sound research practice, but it's also about the validity of your work. So, so uh, ethics nowadays is increasingly about avoiding unnecessary research. If a research is poor practice, it is, it has poor validity, then it's not worth, um, you know, uh, bothering participants and all other stakeholders uh, in that process. So your research uh, um, review board will come back to you with technical feedback as well. So 
Finally, you have to write your paper if you have generated a 15,000 word dissertation. If you want to publish, you need to uh, cut that down to 3,000 to 3,500 words long uh, papers. There's a skill craft involved in that. Um, so there's a whole, so perhaps in the future with, through yet an hour, we could do something around writing articles uh, for publication, uh, you know, academic writing and so forth. Um, but just to highlight that, but, um, but uh, finally to say that dissemination does not just end with, with, um, uh, with, uh, with, the, with your academic colleagues, but you need to, there's a growing field about public engagement and communication ever so important. You need to uh, also package your findings in language that is free from jargon, concise, clear, um, and, and, and share. Um, share um, your findings with patients and the wider um, public. Um, patient and public involvement is, is, is more than that, actually. And um, there are different stages in, in, at, at which you can involve the public in your research. Um, so what you want to avoid is some kind of tokenistic um, a, a involvement um, uh, of, of the public. Nowadays, patients are um, actively being involved in the design, and um, in and, and different stages of, of, of the study. Uh, so always good to um, keep that uh, in mind. With that, here are some references um, for today. And thank you very much for your attention. And we can, we can look at any questions and uh, feedback and discussion points now. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Henok. I've shared the Google Doc for the Q&A. Um, please fill it out in order to get CU credits. Um, I've been collecting questions that were asked on the Q&A board here on the Zoom. Um, so I think we should we should continue with that. Um, Sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Galina. Um, so the first question um, that is that has been that has been continuously asked is about the uh, the choice between quantitative and um, qualitative research. Mm. Um, people were asking which one should we use in what context, uh, uh, which one is better uh, for certain studies. So. If you could get to that, I think that would be great. There are like a few questions, so I can ask in order. Great. Uh, yeah, no, um, as I raised, um, and that could be, there are so many more details there, uh, but that's a really good question. Um, so it depends on the research question, but also other practical reasons um, might be involved, but um, a lot of it would stem from your literature review as well. So. If, if there's a preponderance, a lot of quantitative studies and people haven't. So let me give you an example. For instance, in terms of you know, drug trials, then if there have been a number of trials to date, but something that we don't know is the patient perspective, right? So in terms of dealing with the adverse effects or the way a certain medicine drug is taken, uh, you know, if there are peculiar things to it and how we want to know, about how certain you know, groups of people are dealing with that, then we could, we need to look at you know, qualitative research. But also not just that, don't limit it to that. So I, I, I fear that I might truncate a lot of very complex discussions here. But just to give an example, um, you know, if we are, so for experiences, for perceptions, they say qualitative research has an egalitarian agenda. So it, it seeks to give voice to the voiceless, right? Usually in, in research, clinicians' voices, or you know, if people are being measured, they are summarized into mere tables. That's the field, right? So we want to also ask them, how do you feel? How do you experience this affects you? Uh, how do you perceive the whole policy phenomenon, right? Or if you want to study, expert opinion, there's what we call a Delphi method in qualitative research. If you want to um, uh, capture expert perspectives on how certain measures, certain procedures 
are being undertaken. And if you want to update practice or a lot of policy research, what we call elite interviews. So we discuss with elites and see what their views are, different stakeholders, so different things. So it has different motivations at the end of the day as well, what's your inclination and your interest, right? But you have to keep things aligned between the risk. You can't ask a qualitatively framed question and try to answer it quantitatively. That's, that should be the takeaway message here. Okay, um, there are also many questions about p-value and uh, confidence intervals. So people were asking about the significance of a p-value greater than 0 0.01 or what is the, the, like, the implication of cutoff values for wider and narrow interval. I think this is more of a statistics uh, course that's the, it's beyond the scope of this research, but if you can give like a few highlights regarding those points i think that that would be great there were these questions were being asked repeatedly in the in the chat box great um uh, thank you Kella. for me as well the way i understand this right is it's linked to sample size the power of the study right so we are approximating to the wider population now you can go with so the convention is 0 0.05 you can go with 0 0.01 but that would mean whole different, you're, you're raising the standard, right? So that would mean that if you have a smaller sample size that your confidence interval is going to be prohibitively large range, which is not great, right? Um, so the narrower the, the thing, the, the, uh, the confidence interval is, the more precise your finding is, Right? It indicates that your finding is as precise enough to approximate what we call, sometimes people critic the use of the true population value, but it's a nice approximation. So because you're trying to approximate a true population value, let's say, so you want to keep things narrower um, and people have over time conventionally accepted 0 0.05. Now people are critiquing over reliance on p-values. Right? Because that's not the end, uh, or, and, and you know you can read more on that. Um, but the thing why they raise those things is because is because clinical importance is not the same as statistical significance. Right. So um, so the thing you you need to um, understand um, you know the assumptions uh, through these measures and and the mechanisms why we are applying these things. So it's not just applying them on SPSS or SAS or whatever. If you understand the stats behind it, what they're trying to say is we, we, we can work with this level of confidence, 95%, because it has all practical implications in terms of you know, the data we generate and work with and everything else. I hope, but I, I would encourage people to read more to, to um, you know, get to the heart of it and, um, and understand. Um, but um, yeah, we've, I've included some references at the end uh, which can be used to this uh, end. Yeah, there were also similar questions in that regard. Um, there, there were a lot of questions yeah. asked about multivariate analysis. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. No, I was saying, um, yeah. Uh, response or truth? Yeah, I, I only have uh, 30 people respond. So if we can give them a couple of minutes, like five minutes, because I am sure everyone wants to hear the response. Okay, okay, that makes sense. I posted the link again for anybody that got lost in the chat. Um, yeah, we can, we can do that. Thank you. Sorry. I was speaking again, sorry. <laughs> no, I was saying guys, then let's take a three minutes break. I, I could use some as well. I have my water, so. Ah, oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Great. See you in three minutes.
so just just to clarify, the results will be uh, assessed by Ethiopia Medical Association, and then they will they will send you CEU units. Anyone who answered, I think there's eight questions, right? There's eight questions. Yes. If you answer four questions or more, you will you will get CEU credits from Ethiopia Medical Association. So give them a couple of weeks, like two three weeks, to get the CEU units. Um, We can discuss the answers, right? So that they know how they scored because they won't get the result right away. If we have closed it, I'd be well, happy. When, uh, at the yeah. end, yeah. When uh, we can close it maybe 10 minutes before the session and we can go through the questions quickly. Yeah. Uh, so. After one minute, Ms. Bat Jala. Let's let's discuss the other questions raised and uh, discuss, and we'll five or ten minutes before we'll 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 close the forum. Okay. Um uh Leila related to multivariate analysis, assume a deep statistics course. So uh the basics. Lecture series cover me the game is lenu. Lela Yahut Telegagami Yaki, you who and so research by Misara Besat. How does one make that decision? You know, with a qualitative lamid, with a quantitative lamid, or mixed research in Milan, Nagar Lamestrat? Is there like a roadmap? Not so much mock if a lagut Nagar soon after, not there's like you know, at least Tinish. Cheat cheat code cheat sheet kalle soon discuss Yeah, no worries. Um, no, about just before a multivariate analysis, I think I saw the question. Uh, and there's no big p value massale. Avoid maragaminichlo, so significant result. And then no generate maragaminichlo. I not name a selling Um um the thing is, um, so the 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 variables we select into our model, regression model, has to come from the literature review itself, the things that we need to investigate, right? So, but like I said earlier, if you torture um, data long enough, it will give you a positive result, right? So you need to avoid that practice. Um, so essentially what um, the model, the multivariate model is doing is adjusting for other variables, vis-a-vis -vis the variable of interest and the association with the outcome variable, right? So if there is association, um, and then this all happens in due um, respect of the sample size, so one result, one research might generate uh, uh, a statistically significant association, another might not, because the sample sizes vary, the, maybe the randomization varies, the quality of the data varies. So all these things have to be um, taken into account, but you need to be as comprehensive. You need to be as insightful in selecting your uh, covariates into your uh, multivariate uh, model. Uh, like you say, so th this is what we can say um, on that um, for this session. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of deciding, uh, Yet in your research, you know, uh, select the model. Though again, this is also determined by a. Uh, I mean, in all practicality, people have their own inclinations as well, um, you know. Um, but also in terms of you know the literature, if there's um, a lot of, um, as I said, uh, quantitative evidence. But what we need is digging deep into certain aspects of. Um, you know, the phenomenon that can be um, clarified through more in-depth perspectives from the patient side, from, you know, different uh, population groups, that could be the way to go. Um, so we're saying this um, telehealth research, there are certain disciplines which, you know, disciplinarily as well, qualitative research might even be you know, of if you look at some social sciences, sociology, for instance, and I know there is a strong quantitative um, uh, tradition in sociology, but also you know there's a big on anthropology and um, uh, ethnography. But I'm um, ethnography 
እንትኖች ፐርስፔክቲቮች ከነዚህ ዲሲፕሊን ሁሉ ላይ ነው ወደ ሀዘ ተተብጡት ሶ አንዳንዴ ፊሎሶፊክሊ ራሱ ያንን ፕራዮሪታይ ስለምናደርግ ሊሆን ይችላል ራይት ግን ዋት ዊ ኒድ ቱ ሜክ ሹር ኢዝ ዊ ኒድ ቱ ጀስቲፋይ ዘ ሜተድ አስ ዌል አስ ዘ ኳስቲን ዊዲን ዘ ሪልም ኦፍ ኤክዚስቲንግ ኤቪደንስ ራይት እኛ ስለምንወደው ራሱ ቹዝ ብናደርገው our literature review needs to justify with the rationale that there is an aspect about this that can be advanced by undertaking a qualitative piece of research or a quantitative piece of research um but milo um my attention uh, just one there was one more question here yo uh, galila so if i may um highlight um so lem sali bias indik no avoid min nadergo mil so bias and like we said um could be um, so so systematic no right it could be observer bias in your practice so we need to look at the way we are categorizing things so on um double blind studies in middle of the bias reduce the matter no so he plus and then um um uh, if if someone thinks that they are taking the real drug you know there might be that effect where um uh, you know they might uh, respond to the treatment better than you know the control group um so so soon after the mark patient to blind another gallon uh, blinding to the the intendants of the research uh, the allocation malet no uh, researcher un blind another gallon so that you know and there's always unconscious bias because we do have a stake in generating positive um outcomes uh lela there are types of biases that are specific to different research designs let me say on dropout rate highly on each lab cohort study attrition highly on each lab so um so selection bias the more healthy uh, participants might remain in the study um whereas the more uh, response bias and neger no for cross sectional studies a lot of um cross sectional studies might not um a lot of uh, participants uh, might not respond and this might be systematically different to the ones who respond so we need to do what we call sensitivity analysis as well um bias la maqanas malet now so to make sure that we are selecting um we are selecting uh until la matter um so i i saw your response uh galila in the chat um so the p value uh, the confidence intervals are all about minimizing random error meaning the result might be purely due to chance right it might be due to chance there's no you know underlying relationship between exposure and outcome but because we've taken a certain type of uh, uh, participants you know which are not representative of the wider population that might be the case so that's a way of controlling that across different studies there's there's a set set way to minimize the occurrence of chance relationships um so bias in milonegar it depends on the so you need to be aware of um the the biases that are um usually inherent in some uh, which are likely to occur in different study designs there's a nice summary table that i've provided through one of the slides um but also read more um so in that no response bias the the uh, the cross sectional studies so how do you mitigate making sure that you you may you make sure that one sampling strategy random mon alpet uletenya demo you encourage more response the higher the sample size the more valid your results become kaza demo during your analysis you do um uh, you know you could do matching but also that's why you do your regression analysis to rule out uh chance to rule out um any bias compounding is a form of bias as well right relationship with a third variable that might impact a third or fourth variable that might impact the relationship between the uh, the the predictor and the outcome uh variable so all these things so the way you write up all these things in your uh, in, in your research paper at the end shows people that you done things in in a valid and reliable manner again um you know uh so uh 
Booker is asking, um, is it true that sample size has to be four times to reduce sample error by half? I, I haven't come across that. A lot of the times there are sample size calculations for different um, um, study designs that you can undertake. It's good to undertake those. But at the end of the day as well, you know, there will always be a chance for um, you know, random error. So it will always be determined by, so if you get, if your sample size calculation says 350, then all you could recruit is 150, go ahead and work on your research. What it means is that the confidence interval might be you know, wider, but still valid, right? As long as you write your, um, your results in, in a reflective uh, manner. So I don't uh, believe there's a hard and fast rule there. Yeah, you could do some, as um, people call it, um, blue sky thinking before you settle on one research. Um, but at the end of the day, the research question needs to be well formulated and focused. Uh, so the strategy is to define the concepts implied in the research question. So some of the ideas is to limit by geography, for instance to limit by year, if it's a secondary data analysis that you're undertaking, to be clear about the variables, especially the exposure and outcome variable um, you're interested in. If it's qualitative piece of work, you're not, you know, you're not likely to have a big sample size anyway, um, because your interest is not about size and extrapolating to a number of population. Your interest is in about clarifying on a phenomenon, digging deep, generating contextually with which account of people's lives. Good question, uh, Ante. Um, how can we validate qualitative tools? So something that I haven't highlighted actually is that we have different critical appraisal checklists. Uh, so please look up the CASP checklists. I'll be um, texting that. I'll be texting that uh, in the chat just now. Uh, <clears throat> checklists. Um, so it has. Uh, it's a critical appraisal um, tools checklists for different study designs. So there's one for qualitative research as well. And uh, so if you're looking at your own work or other people's work, how do you evaluate the quality of a research? So we'll give you critical points, issues to ask. So if you're doing um, if you're doing a systematic review, all the papers are subjected to critical appraisal. But I think your question was more about the interview guide. So the interview guide A, um, A has to be, um, you know, so you discuss, right? When you write your paper at the end, how have you validated your interview guide? You should say some things about that. Um, so the, the A, how have you, there are, there are some, um, uh, you know, a good advice um, uh, across, um, uh, you know, uh, different materials that, um, that, uh, that, that advise um, about how to craft a good valid interview guides, um, avoid leading questions, right? And different techniques to generate uh, good findings. But at the end of the day, you need to have that read, read and get feedback from other people so that you're not just leading things in a certain direction. Make sure that there are potent concepts that you're asking through your interview guide and follow good practices to, uh, to put this um, together. Um, lastly, and the again, a better half time mula ayele yemil attend araga so it ayeko. That's a very good question. Uh, nya zi ten ena wagit ena wag research and QI project telai as a rasuni chala project sin sinadag yeten asan betan den yom kinat suno. Um, clinical trial messarat, but I'm a telemedadelem research of Chim Fund Madrek to be a telemedanagaradelem. Gun America was independently funded in Mihonu, independently conducted in Mihonu, Zu research of Chaluna, Yan in practice, where it to be a month at Nasabad Lenina. In terms of research grants, research funds, Nazi Nazi Nagaruch, where they to be a common Mihonu button. 
benefactors hono noro nezi nagrosh fund medal go better man get that's a very good question. Funding constraint is one of the reasons Bzugzetopia's research conducted in my hono. Wayam damo, through quality, Bohona Melku conducted the UN Alonona. That's one of the projects as yet in our research and key while in Saraya Subnomads. No, not thank you, Haftamu, for raising this point. Yeah, and if I may say a couple of things. Um, about one, uh, so um, uh, Dr. Yasin, I've just shared uh, the CASP checklist um, web pages. If you go to the uh, top tabs, there are different checklists that you can check. Leila Odomo, Kalkida, and the question around um, uh, tips around choosing a good topic to produce a successful paper and make it easy during their college day, that is a very good, pertinent, practical question. Okay, and so what I you know there are some things that I would say choose something that you're really interested in one, right, um, and read um you know research papers as you go along um right make it a habit to go out read journals see how people write things and then it's it's um it's a it's an insight but also it's a skill. Right? It's a know-how, but also it's a skill over time that you develop. So the more you do that, and um, you know, the more you enjoy the research journey, be super organized. Research is about resources. Time is one of the resources, how you manage your time and how you do things in because it's everything is sequenced. If you've allotted enough time for your data collection, then you'll have enough time for your data analysis, leave enough time for your write-up. A lot of Common mistakes are people spend too much time in the field. They come back, they want to write within a few days. Okay, so there are common tips around how you can make things um, uh, enjoyable, but uh, not a single simple answer, but a really, really good um, question to ask. Jose, you want to jump in? Yeah, we can go over them. I don't know who has control of the uh, Google form. We can we can close it now, Galida or Saga. I Yeah, if if we can close the response, uh, let us know when it's done. Henny, you have the questions with you, right? I do have the questions, but if someone is able to share from your end, that'd be brilliant. So we can go uh, one and by one. If people can see. Or let me try and locate it here. Uh, I can I can share the screen. Uh, that would be perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Galila. And um, yeah, I hope I do remember the answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, gotcha. Okay. So the first is which one is not considered a key quality of a research question. So it's in view of the presentation we've made, uh, right? Clarity is important and key is the question. So it's ambition is not uh, what we highlighted, right? Clarity, focus and visibility were the ones we highlighted. So if you've listened to the talk, that should be a low hanging fruit. Um, the second one. Thank you. Which one of the following is an appropriate aim for the research question? And as we say, the research question is literally a restatement of the research question. Um, the aim uh, is a restatement. Um, um, so it is to determine uh, the effect of sleep deprivation. B is the answer. Uh, because the others either fall short of the full scope or go beyond the scope. <laughs> and the third one, which of the following could not make, would not make an appropriate objective. So again, thinking about going beyond the scope specified in the research question. So that's um, uh, uh, to introduce a curriculum within medical education, C would be the answer. Because everything is within the research generation uh, process. This is an implication rather than an objective that, that comes under the aim. 
which of the following is incorrect? Um, existing gaps, find your uh, research question. Yes, uh, a literature review helps clarify the variables to be included in the analysis. Yes, so D is the answer, right? It helps clarify your variables. It, it helps identify gaps and it helps refine your research question. For quantitative studies, what's the likely impact of increasing the sample size, right? Um, uh, reduces sampling error, yes. It increases the sampling error. Um, it reduces the validity of the result. It has an effect. So it reduces the sampling error, as we've been saying all along. Which of the following statements is incorrect? Uh, qualitative and quantitative studies are equally valid um, as long as they, that is incorrect, but let me see the others. The research is um, not involved in qualitative, yes. The research question should determine the choice of method. Yes, mixed methods research uses both qualitative methods to generate a more complete. So A is incorrect. Right? The condition that they have to have the same sample size. As we said, qualitative can be smaller. Seven, which of the following is incorrect about research ethics? Ensuring that research participants are fully informed of the study prior to participation. Yeah, making sure that the study employs valid methods is true as well. Making sure uh, that the study influences key policies. So C, that is not the realm of um, an ethics evaluation necessarily. One of the following is inaccurate um, about dissemination of research findings. You need to use appropriate language. Um, patients can be included as targets in dissemination plan. Uh, design dissemination plan at the end of the study. So C is incorrect because you have to have a dissemination plan from the outset. Yeah, so we've had uh, people um, responding to the answers in the chat, which were largely correct. So that's good to see. All right, perfect. I think we had a very great session with a large number of attendants today, almost 200 plus people we were, um, we were at one time. And just to uh, let you know the attendees, like we have uh, more than 40 CME sessions planned for this year. So uh, make sure that you follow the Atenaux uh, Telegram channel for healthcare professionals so that you can get the links for upcoming CME sessions. Um, Galila was briefly mentioning earlier about it in our QI and health uh, research project. Uh, here actually, luckily we have Galila and Henok who will be leading that project. It just aims to um, uh, increase participation from ATP and healthcare professionals, to medical students, or early healthcare professionals to you know, actively engage in research. We're also developing uh, a database for ATP and healthcare researchers. So, if you have questions like the one you had today that you've been asking Henok and Galila, you'll have much more direct access to much more diverse group of healthcare researchers. And then make sure you follow this space and uh, Telegram channel that I mentioned earlier, so that you you know you, when we go live, you'll be updated. And we also will try to um, get local funding for research in Ethiopia. Most of research are funded by uh, foreign sources or I mean uh, other donations so but if we get the culture of you know funding our own research that would you know cultivate that uh, research interest much better so we'll work on that uh, and also Galila is also working on um, I think trying to help the market fund healthcare research so she can say something mm -hmm. about if anybody's interested like uh, you can contact her she can drop her email and contact her how you can you know take part in you know uh, part be part of our project as well and uh, you can speak about that yeah thank you Jose. so i'm doing this project called the telai program 
ዴቨሎፕ ያደረግ ነው ስለሆነ ስለሆነ ብዙ ማድቨርታይዝ አላረግ ነው ማሁን ግን ፉሊ እንጀምራለን ቢያስባለው ካሚንግ ላይ ካፌብራሪ ጀምሮ ያደረግን ያለ ነው ነገር ምንድነው ሄልዝ ኬር ፋይናንስ ኢትዮጵያ ውስጥ እንደምታቆት इट्स a big issue ብዙ ሄልዝ ኬር ላይ ምንሰራቸው ነገሮች they are underfunded ሲስተሙ በጣም በትንሽ ገንዘብ ነው የሚንቀሳቀስ ያለውና እሱን ችግር ሶልቭ ለማድረግ እኛ ያያሰብን ያለ ነው ነገር ከማርኬት ቤዝድ ሶሉሽን መፈለግ ማለት ነው እሱም እንዴት ነው የሚሆነው ኮርፖሬሽኖች ኦርጋናይዜሽኖች ቢዝነሶች ኮርፖሬት ሶሻል ሪስፖንሲቢሊቲ አላቸው ወይም ለሶሳይቲው የሚጠቅም ነገር የሚያደርጉበት በጀት ሶ እሱም በጀት ወደ ሄልዝ ኬር እንዴት አርገንና አምጣው የሚለው ነገር ነው እየሰራን ያለ ነውና ጥላይ ከተለያዩ ማልቲ ዲሲፕሊነሪ ከሆኑ ሰዎች ጋራ አንድ ላይ ኮላቦሬት አርገን የምንሰራው ነገር ነውና ኮርፖሬት ሶሻል ሪስፖንሲቢሊቲውን አውትሶርስ ነው ምናደርገው ሶ ገንዘብ ፋንዱን እየተቀበለ ሄልዝ ኬር ላይ እናውላለን የመጀመሪያው ፕሮጀክታችንን ይርጋለም ሆስፒታል ላይ ሰርተናል የመጀመሪያው እና ብዙ ሰዎች መርዳት ይችላል በዛው ውስጥና እየሰፋን ያሰፋን እና ብዙ ኮንታክቶችን እየፈጠረን ወደፊት ለመቀጠል እናስባለን እና ኢፍ ኤኒባዲ ኢዝ ኢንትረስትድ ፕሮጀክት መስራት ላይ ዲዛይን ማድረግ ላይ ኤክዚኪዩት ማድረግ ላይ ኢንትረስትድ ዮናቹ ካላችሁ ፕሊዝ ኮንታክት ሚ ኢሜይል ላይ እንዚ ቻት ቦክስ ላይ አረጋለሁ any we just have few words about our uh, plan it in our research and qi project as part of an active lead yeah thank uh, you for say. and uh, yeah really exciting plans alani uh, most of all but i'm excited me adergen ye ye mentorship na programu i think we are aiming to make um you know expertise available not just us but across the board we i am very cognizant በጣም ብዙ ሪሰርቸሮች ዛሬም ተሳትፎ ሊሆን ይችላል አይ ኖ እዚ ሴሽን ላይ ሶ ዊ ዋንት ቱ ሊንክ ስቱደንትስ አርሊ ካሪየር ሪሰርቸርስ ዊዝ ሞር ሲዘን ሪሰርቸርስ ኢን ኢን ሜኪንግ ዳት ዩ ኖ አድቫይዝ ኤንድ ኢንፑት ሞር አቬሌብል ኤንድ አልሶ ሆልድ ዚስ ሴሚናርስ ሞር ሬጉላርሊ እሱም በጣም ኤክሳይት ያደርጋል ዊ ኤም ቱ ኢንቫይት አዘር um experts and um and and researchers as well so yeah it's exciting time ahead alenim ka yetenaw gar ka topian medical association gar um collaborate ba madrege betam betam des bulonyal um research and yalan saut neger collaborative endeavor no you know you can't just do it on your own so collaborative in the endeavor there are other soft skills around you know teamwork how you um collaborate across different disciplines as well multidisciplinarity uh, so um uh, you know um i i hope it's going to be a very fruitful um collaborative um endeavor for us all is are you um attendance and but i'm just blowing the active um, participation all around so really really glad um to be here um thank you everyone uh, for setting this up and for all the active participation thank you and and just to say Uh, i i did the thing in english because yeah you know it's a thing uh, uh information uh, because um uh, there was a feeling that there might be uh, people in the diaspora who might not speak amharic well i don't know and ji be amarenyam discuss madreg chal neber bsoch negeroch um so ya no madet michilo thank you thank you so much everyone thank you very much dr hinok uh very excellent presentation as we can see from the chat box everybody is very much happy um thank you very much dr galila for coordinating it and yet in our team as well as ema uh, we hope to see you again dr hinok in other presentations thank you very much have a good day yeah, okay thank you